Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, for the millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. The expansion of vote by mail, early voting, online registration, and online ballot requests broke down many of the traditional barriers that sometimes kept people away from the ballot box. Nearly 160 million Americans voted in the 2020 elections, by far the most in history, and a level of turnout not seen in over 100 years, representing an extraordinary milestone of civic engagement in a year marked by a devastating pandemic and record unemployment and political unrest. That, according to the New York Times, an article that we've had on the docket for a while and now have the opportunity to talk about, almost 160 million people voting, Will it change the way America conducts elections? There's been a lot of conversation past number of weeks here, it seems, about the need for voter ID and perhaps restricting how we vote and where we vote, when we vote, or expanding it. And here on The State of Us, we feel that it's imperative that we take time to discuss this because the reality is 160 million people are affected by this. And actually, a lot more than that, if we take into account their family, friends, and all the people's lives that the United States touches. You could argue this is something that affects the entire global population, Lance. Uh, But of course, we couldn't begin a conversation on the political system of the United States and access to voting without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years. Here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. And the interesting point is it's up to each individual state to determine those rules. And so when you have Democrats in charge of some states and Republicans in charge of other states, then you get different voting rules. And then we all vote for the one national office under different under a different set of rules. And so there's that whole discussion as well. But I thought for the word of the day, I would look up disenfranchise. And when I found it in my dictionary, disenfranchise says the same as disfranchise, which I'd never heard. So I had to flip to disfranchise. There you find disfranchise, disfranchised, disfranchising, verb transitive, to deprive the, of the rights of citizenship, especially of the right to vote, to deprive of a privilege, right, or power, disfranchisement. So not disenfranchise, which is also a word, but disfranchise. So there you have a little <clears throat> word for the day. And I, I think it's very important when we're talking about then, if you read the definition and listen there, it is taking the power or a right away from someone. And is that what we want to do as we talk, as we talk about voting? Do we want to encourage people to vote or do we want to take that right away from them or that power away from them? So today we get to kind of look at three elements of this that fit with our segments of the show. The first one being uh, why this is historic and maybe how it sort of contradicts history, making sure that we set our premise for what we're discussing, because I think a lot of people have an idea about uh, what America should be versus what America is. And then also transitioning to talking about, so what about voter ID, right? Modern society. We can talk about history all we want, but where do we go from here? And that's what leads us into the third segment. So um, interestingly enough, Lance, I... I talked to you briefly about this before the show, and part of what I think we we got to set the stage with, right, is because people like to talk about the founding fathers and the nation, but let's talk about really, right, a government for the people in their minds, and you tell me if you think this is too much of a leap, does not necessarily mean a government decided by the people. In other words, we can ensure the well-being of the people. We can have a government that serves people doesn't necessarily mean all the people have a voice in said government. Most of our founding fathers generally viewed it as people uh, that owned males, that owned property, were the people that voted. And that typically obviously meant white people. There are some exceptions to that rule, but the vast majority of voters were white males because those were the people that owned much of the property and in, in many states were eligible to vote. Um, and, and, and interestingly, 
the very argument that some of the founders make, right, against why you don't want people that don't own property to vote, in the words of somebody that I often refer to, uh, John Adams, in his letter to um, James Sullivan, says, and this is in 1776, right, the year of our the year of our founding, he says, few men who have no property have any judgment of their own. They talk and vote as they are directed by some men of property who has attached their minds to interest. And the interesting thing about that is, there's some supposition here, is that he's almost suggesting that, uh, you know, people who don't have property of their own, which at the time would be people that are, you know, farming or, or running a business, probably related to farming, uh, because that was the major industry in the United States, that those people are very subject to the ebb and flow of whatever other people are telling them. Now, whether or not that's true, that's part of the supposition of why they felt, at least at the time, that only people that own property should be voting. There are plenty of countries in the world where that's still true today, where they, you know, the only people that get to vote are the people that are in power because, hey, how do you stay in power? Well, you only let people like you vote. That's the easy way to stay in power. But as I told you, I think where we have to commend our founding fathers is that it wasn't too long down the road when things began to change and more and more people, they began to get the right to vote. And again, the historical content, people didn't like it. You go back to the election of, of 1824 when Andrew Jackson got the most votes from the popular people, which opened it up to more Western Westerners, meaning people living west of the Appalachian Mountains at that time, got to vote. He got the most votes of the people. He got most of the votes in the Electoral College, but he did not get the majority that he needed to win. And so the election went to the House of Representatives and they chose John Quincy Adams. And a political deal was made between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. And the Westerners had were, were furious. The election, and this sounds so familiar, right, folks? The election was stolen from us, Jackson and his supporters said. And four years later, Andrew Jackson ran for president and won. And they had this wild party uh, at the White House where they had to take the alcohol outside. So because people inside were breaking dishes and tables and chairs and everything else. So when we talk about this whole voter and voter submission and disenfranchisement, it's it's been in our history and in, in our vernacular forever. But I think what our founding fathers did was they opened it up and and came up with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which allowed for us to continue and in our within our history have opened up voting for more and more groups of people. And I think that's what we've come to expect that we, we have, you know, and, and now when there's this talk of not allowing certain groups to vote is why we need to push back because that's what it make that's what makes the United States of America different than other countries. There are many, many countries in the world where only the wealthy or the landowners or the business people are the ones that get to vote. That's what makes us different as the shining light of democracy that some of us like to talk about is that we've worked through some of those struggles and we realize that a country will become stronger the more people that get involved in said government. And the easiest way to get involved with your government is to vote. One of the things that we are reckoning with as the world's current oldest democracy, what I mean by that, just to be clear, right, from a record standpoint, is we are the longest standing democracy that's still in existence, okay? And I think part of understanding that is the quote-unquote idea of what we were doing at the time we were doing it, right, was very novel. It still is, but it's different today than it was then. And I think that's part of what, the older we get, the more and more it is that way, right? Some of the things some of those things that our founders would have said, some of the things that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and others, Washington, right, uh, James Madison, that they may have said at the time would seem to us to be out of touch today. Uh, but they also lived uh, many, 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 many years ago. And what they were doing at the time was still pretty radical for the time, you know. So 
I think it's that whole, the context is very important. And that's not to say that it makes okay what they, what they were suggesting either, but it is to say that understanding where we come from and why we still struggle with this today is because our founders really didn't, most of them didn't believe that everybody should just have the right to vote. They, you know, for the most part believed it should be reserved to a certain group of people, you know, for racial reasons, for educational reasons, for monetary reasons. They had different, you know, I think they had, they each had different reasons, some more prevalent than others, but they all had feelings about there are people who shouldn't vote, you know, for one reason or another. Um, some were less objectionable than others. But that doesn't make them right. No. Just because they had those feelings. You're right that historically that's where they were, but that doesn't make those feelings correct. And the thing that we grapple with, and as we transition in the, to the next segment, the thing to think about is we generally accept today the prerequisites to voting uh, depend on the state that you're in. But for the most part, there's no... You know, you don't have to be educated to a certain degree or know things about what's happening. Um, you can want anybody uh, believe anything and still vote, theoretically, uh, whether or not in practice that's the case. That's kind of what we think. But that is very starkly different from what our founders originally thought of when they thought of voting. And that is part of why I think we have these conversations then, Lance, about Look at all these people that voted. Look at what it got us. There's a lot of people that don't aren't necessarily happy with the result, right? Or feel that maybe uh, when you have this many people voting, that there's more, you know, fraud or illegal voting. Uh, so now we have to talk about again, right? What should be required in order to vote in a democracy like ours? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about coming up. Keep it here on the State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are the state of us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Voter identification, something that has, I think, Lance, been a, a hot topic on and off for how many years? A long time, right? Depending on what state you're in, it's uh, very different. And this year in particular, or 2020, excuse me, highlighted, I think, for us, right, the different types of voting that are available and the different process of validating those different votes. Uh, for example, in the state of Ohio, right, if you're going to show up and vote in person, uh, you must bring a valid form of identification. Uh, that could be a photo ID, such as something issued by the United States government or the state of Ohio that includes things like your photograph, an expiration date, the name, etc. A military ID, a utility bill, a bank statement, a government check, a paycheck, or other government document. Those are the acceptable forms of identification in the state of Ohio for in-person voting. Uh, but it's a little different if you vote via mail and what's acceptable. And that's just one example of there's a lot of different things in Ohio, right, that you could potentially use. Whether or not your individual polling place is familiar with accepting it or will accept it is up to some debate. So that leads us to something that Lance and I have discussed before, which is the idea that, yeah, we view ourselves as a single nation, but in reality, especially when it comes to elections, we're more like 50 little nations that are all uh, coming together to cast ballots in one big thing. And I think that's another one, right, where that creates some tension because if what I have to do in one state to vote and what I have to do in another state to vote for the president of the United States, which all the states are participating in, are different, if I live in one state where voter ID is strict and one state where it's less strict, uh, that might lead me to feel like people in that other state, right, there's going to be people voting that shouldn't be voting. And vice versa might be true. If I live in a state where the access is relatively simple uh, versus a state where it's relatively complicated, I might feel like people are being prevented from voting that should be able to vote. And so I think that's, to me, Lance, that's a big part of what creates the tension, less so than is there actual voter fraud. It has more to do with we have so many different rules and systems that depending on who you ask and where they are in the country, they are feeling the inequity, not in the sense of 
I don't have the same rights as other people, but different people in different areas are playing by different rules. And we like that idea of uniformity in rules. And we don't have that. Well, I mean, I think there may be some, <clears throat> an air quotes here, voter fraud, because anytime you have a rule, there are going to be some cases where some people break them. The question becomes, is it enough that really makes a difference? And <clears throat> the the problem is, is that that's become then, well, since there might be some voter fraud, which let's face it, all of the cases brought before all the different courts, everybody said there isn't any. OK, so there wasn't any voter fraud that was proven in this last election. So if there were some illegal votes in certain places, a big if, big, huge if, but it's not probably going to change the outcome. But that's become the catchphrase now. Well, then this is how we can disenfranchise people. We can because there is voter fraud, we have to work to make the voter laws tougher so that we can take out all the cheating. And my point is, no matter what rules you have, somebody's going to find a way to cheat. And I just use this back when they were disenfranchising African-American voters and they passed, they couldn't say that. So they said, well, we're going to have a literacy test. Well, they found out in many of those states that had literacy tests that many of the poor whites couldn't read or write either, that they were sharecroppers or whatever, and they hadn't gone to school. And so what they would do is they would give them, you know, a, a first grade reader, C. Dick Run. And they, they, oh, they read, they saw they could read C. Dick Run. Okay. And the, the registrar would say, you can vote. And then an African American would come and they would hand them the state constitution and say, okay, read the preamble of the state constitution. And the first word they stumbled on, they said, nope, you don't know how to read, you can't vote. So even when you get into these ways that people try to uh, make sure there's no voter fraud, the way they are assessed to different human beings causes there to be, in my opinion, uh, a disparity that causes even a greater problem than any quote, illegal vote that might have been taken. And I think we're living in nirvana if we think that we can have any election or any rule that stops all things from happening. I mean, okay, we put up speed limit signs. How many people disregard that? I mean, and we, and we don't, oh, we're not getting all bent out of shape about that. And I, and, and you know, people say, well, this is voting. Okay. My point is anytime you have rules, there might be things that slip through. But if you want a democracy, you should have more people voting. I mean, we've advocated for that on this show for multiple years and multiple shows is that people, if you don't like what's going, go vote. So now what do we do? We see more people vote in this election, a higher percentage. What did the New York Times article say? Something like 68 percent, the highest in since the 1900s, the highest percentage possibly ever in American history, the number of people that go to vote. And instead of rallying around that and saying, yes, finally, more and more people are participating in a democracy. The pushback is, oh, we got to make it harder to vote. Are you kidding me? In, in most general elections, only 35 to 45 percent of the people who are eligible to vote bother to vote. This time we get over 65 percent of the people. And now we're going to make it harder. The benefits of increasing access to voting outweigh the downsides of it. And one of the, I think the most notable one, right, is that there is no, um, you know, substantial ongoing voter fraud in the United States. There is, there is always, right? I mean, it's, you can't, to your point, you can't have systems uh, that people don't cheat. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's not how people are. There's always going to be those people out there that want to subvert and, you know, undermine the system or, or take advantage of it unfairly. That's just how that is. But at the end of the day, uh, there has been no evidence of any election, you know, local, state, federal, uh, any time in recent history where voter fraud changed the outcome of an election, right? Which at the end of the day, I mean, that's what we should care about, right? If voter fraud had the capacity to make somebody an elected official, who was not supposed to be an elected official. That would be something that we should all say, whoa, wait a minute, we got to do something about that. Because none of us want an election to be handed to somebody who isn't deserving of the election, right? Who didn't win what we would all consider fair and square. Uh, I think hopefully we could all agree on that. At the same time, though, the point is that's not happening, right? So 
do we have a hodgepodge system uh, that is confusing and often difficult to understand, especially if you go from one state to the other? I think so. I think that there's a lot that can be done to make it better, which also makes it, in my opinion, more secure. You want it to be secure. It needs to be clear and easy to understand because there's a better chance that the people who, the local people, right? Because when it comes down to it, who's delivering the election? It's a lot of volunteers and a lot of non-professionals who are showing up to these polling places. They're the ones that are handling the votes. And when you make things super complicated at a state level, well, we got to do this, 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 and these, and these, and these, it just, it adds to the likelihood that one, they're going to make a mistake, right? And that mistake could be in favor of letting somebody vote who's not supposed to, or it could be the opposite, preventing somebody from voting who should be allowed to vote because it's too complicated. And we're asking them to keep track of, I mean, you know, I'm looking at this page, Lance, right here, right, for the state of Ohio. And I mean, it's, there's at least 500 words here, maybe more about the different types of IDs and in what situations they're acceptable and what you have to do to know if it's acceptable. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, do we really think that every volunteer and poll worker is truly going to know this? Because it, that's my point is it leads to those two things. If we make it simpler and it's a more unified process, it is both easier for poll workers to make sure that people who should be voting vote and who are not prevented from voting. There's less ambiguity in the whole thing. And I think that's better for everybody. You and I talked about, it seems kind of backwards that state elections are run by states, right? But federal elections apparently are also run by states. Why is that? Local elections, right? Like your city uh, or county-based elections are usually run by the county, depends on what state you're in, with some oversight from the state. State elections are run by the state with really not hardly any oversight from the federal government. And federal elections, for some reason, are the only form of our government elections that are not run by the government entity for which the elections are for the purpose of. And that's why we have 20 million different kinds of combinations of how you can vote and when you can vote in different states. In my 35 years in the classroom, you start out with all of these rules and it's so hard to enforce them. And I very quickly and spent the last 30 years with only two or three classroom rules because it was so much easier to enforce because the, to your point, the more rules you have, the harder it is to enforce them and make sure that everybody follows them and that everybody knows them and understands them. And so if you streamline the system, it makes it so much simpler. And that's just a little anecdotal piece that, you know, within my classroom is that the more rules I had, the harder it was to enforce them and to make sure that people weren't cheating. You know, whatever it was, whether they were class on time or, or whatever the rule was. And so my classroom list of, of rules was always the shortest in, in every building that I ever worked in. And, and it's like, but you never have any problem. I said, there you go. You don't have a long list. You don't have a lot of problems, you know. And so to your point, I think that's that's the key is let, let's let's streamline it and make it easier We shouldn't be making it harder. So what's next? Where do we go from here? More to come. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. A government by the people and for the people needs the people's input to make sure that it's running effectively and in a manner to which it serves the people. And keeping in mind that, that's kind of what we're trying to do here on The State of Us. So we want to hear from you. Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. Lance and I were actually just discussing before we came on the show today, reading and replying to listeners that had sent us uh, some comments. We love seeing and hearing those. So please uh, send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. So when we talk about the specifics, Lance, um, I think you and I, I think people that have been listening to the show would know that you and I often feel like we try to be hesitant about just saying, oh yeah, the federal government should just take care of this. Because we've done that with a lot of things in this country over the years. Some of them have been good. Some of them we know have been disasters uh, because we've learned, right? There are things that the government is good at doing. And then there are these things that the government 
really sucks at doing. If we could simplify the system, it sounds nice in theory, but the, one of the things that I worry about is, well, we'll simplify it at the federal level, right? But then the states still all have their own rules about their individual elections. Um, I think that's one of those, to me, where the, the communication from the people to the states, right, to your local government, to your federal government needs to be, we want things to be easier to understand. We want them to be simpler, uh, to your point at the end of the last segment. Uh, it's not that we don't want rules, but we need rules that everybody can understand and know. One of the reasons I loathe doing taxes, and one of the reasons I've stopped doing it myself, not because I don't think I should pay taxes, because I am, I am genuinely afraid that I will make a mistake and break a rule that I'm not trying to break. That would be one of the greatest disservices that our country does is when we have so many rules that people can't, people who want to know the rules, people who want to follow the rules, make honest mistakes and don't follow the rules and then are punished for not following the rules, even though they wanted to follow the rules, you know? Yep. They weren't trying to do anything wrong. They wanted to do the right thing, right? And we see that with voting. I mean, we see people who come and they want to vote and they didn't understand the rules. And it varies a lot by state. In some states, that's not a big issue. In other states, it's a bigger problem where they show up and it's, I didn't understand. But, you know, running for local office, Lance, we spent a lot of time communicating to people the rules around voting because it isn't even, you know, in the state of Ohio, it's not simple. But my point is, is those rules are made by the people in power and they make them convoluted and difficult to understand, in my opinion, to be able to stay in power because then that allows them to kick out the people who don't understand the rule or who didn't take the time to learn the rule, which in many cases, again, in my opinion, is stupid so that they can then kick out that vote so that they can stay in power. And that's what's got to stop. That's what's driving this in my opinion. It's not, it's not we're worried about somebody's cheating. We're worried about whether or not our group can stay in power. Otherwise, why would you make it difficult for anybody to vote? If you truly believe in democracy and the power of the vote and the right of people to vote, why would you make it more and more difficult for people to actually vote? The only reason I can come up with that you want to make it more difficult to vote is because you don't want certain people to vote so that you have an easier chance of staying in power. And that's wrong. In my opinion, that's wrong. So what do you think should be required to vote? What do we, what, and, and you, you out there too, send us an email. What should be required? Because I think this is something that, as we know, I mean, just from talking in today's show, varies a lot based on state. What, what do you, what do you need to do? In order to vote, should you have to register to vote? You know, should you have to be at least 18? Should you need to tender an identification when you show up? Uh, those, those things I just mentioned, by the way, are the, the few things that generally speaking, right, it, are, are the same in all states. You have to register, uh, you have to be 18 and you have to provide. Now the term that what we mean by ID is very different in every state, but those are generally the three basic and you have to be, well, sorry, you have to be a United States citizen. But we've had so many elections in the history of this country where none of that was required because there was no driver's license. So what do you license. think? There was no ID. Is that too much? Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there because people will say, will jump on it and say, well, of course you have to be an American citizen. Well, of course you need to be a certain age. Well, of course you need to be able to prove that uh, you live where you live. And of, of course you need to do that. Okay. And I'm not saying that that's, if that's what you want to do, you know, I mean, have some of those basic. Well, is that what you okay. want to do? Well, I don't know because I'm, <laughs> because I'm really struggling with this one because I'm sitting tough. here thinking and then, well, we, we didn't have it in the election of 1844. Right. We didn't have that in the election of 1796. We didn't have that in the election of 1900. But just because we know, didn't most, have it doesn't we, make we, it we, right. We, but we managed, right? We became a country. We we grew as a country. We achieved manifest destiny. We fought. We fought two. We world, also became a country without women wars. being allowed to vote. Right. But does that mean by adding all this stuff, all of a sudden we're, we're making it better? Not necessarily. Is, is is that is that really right? Exactly. Not necessarily. We had issues, but you always have issues. So so is it? Sh should you have to choose between a couple of things? 
Should we put a limit on it? Put a cap on it? Okay, you can have whatever you want, but you got to have five. But, you know, can you have whatever you want? Should you have a poll tax? Should you have a – I mean, you can't now because it's in the Constitution. You have to take – yeah, you'd have to take it out of the Constitution. Which we can do. Well, until people take away your right to vote. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and again, there's another reason, right? If you take away enough people's right to vote, then you can change the Constitution, and then that empowers you to – take over these people that you've disenfranchised. I think there ought to be some some rules, but then I'm arguing against myself when I say voting ought to be made as simple as possible. I mean, I voted for the first time absentee ballot or through the mail this time in this last election. I was a first, I'd always vote. I, you know, I think I've shown up like 90% of the time to vote in any election, not just presidential. You know, I can't think of a presidential election I've missed since I was eligible to vote. But even in local elections, I think I've got like a 90% voting rate. And everything was always done in person. So this was the first time at the age of 59 where I voted in a different way. And it was simple. And I didn't cheat, you know? And and my wife voted the same way. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, you know. And, oh, and by the way, folks, that's the way President Trump voted as well in multiple elections before he became president. It wasn't voter fraud in all those other elections. So maybe maybe that's the way to go. Do we stop in-person voting and do it like a lot of the wealthy people do who travel the country and travel the world and they're not there on election day? So for years, they've used the absentee or mail-in ballot. The very people that are claiming voter fraud use that system. Or do we take it or do we take it away and say the only way you get to vote is if you show up on the day? And, and, we, and we're, and we're different states have toyed with both, right? Right. And we're, we're on, oh, oh, besides that, not only are we going to limit the hours, we're going to limit the places you can go. Because we saw that in multiple states where there used to be 20 precincts to vote. Now there's one precinct. Well, to that's vote. happened right here, right? I mean, we've got... We've gone through that, the consolidation in our own county of, I mean, we used to have, I, I'd have to, you'd have to add them up, Lance, but I would say there was probably at least 15 different places that you could go vote. There is now one place that you may go vote. And that is, that is the board of elections at the county building, uh, which yes, is basically in the center of the county. But as you and I've talked about for some people, that is a, that is a 60 minute round trip, you know? Um, and for some, a little longer, depending on where you are in the county. It's a rural county, right? It's not like you can just get on a road and drive straight to the Board of Elections. There's You have to you know, take two or three different... I'm for making voting as, as simple as possible. So I have as few rules as possible. I don't know what that is. Yeah. So uh, go back and listen to the first hundred shows that we ever did together. And this is, I'm back to where, what used to make you mad? Cause I never came up with a real decision. This one, this one's got me stumped. So I know we're, I know we're running out of time, but that's really where I am. I just want to make it, I want to get as many people who are eligible to vote, to vote. And we need to decide, I guess, on what eligibility is. And for me, that would be, you're an American citizen and you're 18 years of age. There you have it. <laughs> and if you can prove, if you can prove those two things, then you should be able to vote. I was feeling, just so you know, Lance, before we started the episode, I was feeling the same way. This is, it is tough because it's easy to say, right, what we're saying, which is that we want people to vote. How do you do it in a way uh, that doesn't open up the system to millions of people voting that we, that generally we would all agree we don't want to vote, you know? Um, do we really want 10-year-olds to vote? I mean, that's a show all itself, right? Uh, most of us adults would probably say no, but interesting how, right, uh, in history, that's not all that. Is that really that different than white male landowners saying that we don't want uh, black people to vote because they might think something different? Well, we don't want 10 year olds to vote because they might vote for different things. Right. I mean, it, it, and I understand Right. That can sound like a crazy version of that. But that's the point. When you have these conversations, it can be really tough because it is all about where do you draw these lines and are, are, can we really feel good about any of them? Um, you can discuss all you want. Right. Uh, what makes you a citizen? I think at a fundamental level, uh, I'm I'm with Lance on that one of you need to be a United States citizen. Right. Um, if you're going to be voting in the process of deciding who's going to represent the United States of America, you need to be a citizen. Now we can talk all day about 
how you become a citizen, who is a citizen, fine, right? And I think we got to talk about that. We've talked about that many times, but that should be a requirement. Now, what you have to do to be a citizen, different conversation. Um, the age thing, I guess I'm not, on this episode, I'm not prepared to say that I have a, I have a good feeling on that one. Sadly, I don't. Um, it, it's tough, you know, it's, it's difficult. I don't like um, our 21 years of age 18 years of age, 25 years of age policy stuff that we do right now. I don't like that. Um, I think as we've talked about on other episodes, I think it is a system that we put in place that's very black and white and we think that it's going to work for everybody. And for some, uh, it unfairly holds them back. And for others, it unfairly elevates them. There are people that are ready to be adults sooner than other people. Uh, and that type of system just you know, uh, I think it just enforces that kind of thing at the same time, very difficult to change to anything else that isn't really murky. And so to Lance's point, that's why this is complicated. And that's why we want your input. Um, if you don't think that people should have to be United States citizen, definitely want to hear from you because I think that's a, it's a fascinating conversation. Um, but what should the other requirements be? Should, you know, what is the age requirement? Uh, we know what it is right now, but what should it be? Um, Because I think that stuff plays into it. And what should you have to do to prove that you're qualified to vote in the election you're voting in? In other words, if I'm going to vote, right, for mayor of the city of Urbana, uh, I probably shouldn't live in Texas. So what do I, what, what should be the prerequisite to get that done? It's tough. It's tough. Send us your thoughts, podcast at the state of us.org, podcast at the state of us.org. We'd like to see an email from you because that's what we're about here, Lance, right? Is having these conversations. They're not necessarily easy. And we try to be honest with people. We don't always have all the answers. That's, that's just how it is. Uh, you and I come up with a lot more ideas sometimes than the 535 people of our elected federal representatives. Uh, and you, we still can't come up with everything, right? We got to have some help. We just have the discussion. And that's our, that's part of our mission statement here at True Chat is to educate people by providing honest, open and respectful conversations. And that's what we do. We don't ever claim to have all the answers. We just have the discussion and hopefully it gets things going in your mind and in the people that you talk to and that as a group, we can come up with the best solution possible. So if you're listening to the show and you like it, and you're talking to other people about it and they say, well, how do we find out about this? You know, how, where do we listen? Tell them we, we're on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is both a syndicated radio show and a podcast. New episodes of the podcast are Tuesdays and Thursdays by 4 a.m. East. And you can hear the syndicated radio version on, in select talk markets across the country. So check your local talk stations, see if they carry us. If they don't, Call them up and tell them they should. We did a great episode recently, Lance, on Fix America. This is how. If you haven't heard it yet, go listen to it because that is one where we talk about some some concrete things that uh, might have the opportunity to really make the nation better. And uh, we got some interesting feedback on it. So do take a listen. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our recording producer, Devin McCain, editing producer, Bradley Butch. Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.